Welcome to Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that what you hear encourages you in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Stay tuned afterwards for more information. If you've got a Bible, I invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalm 96 is where we are going to be today. Psalm 96. If you were here last Sunday, uh, Pastor Jerron preached a message just kind of in, in anticipation for the new year, in anticipation for 2020. Um, and today, I want to stay in that same lane. As we just look forward uh, to the new year, I want to just give you a couple considerations as we uh, look at this psalm together. Um, and if you've got a bulletin, uh, you'll notice that my title is this for this sermon, A Vision for 2020, Theology, Doxology, and the Mission of God. A vision for 2020, theology, doxology, and the mission of God. So that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about vision. Uh, Vision has to do with the ability to see. Vision has to do with sight. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about uh, the physical ability to see in 2020. Today, I want to give you a way of seeing a perspective in 2020, Um, a way of of viewing things around you, maybe even a worldview. Um, I want to give you a worldview, something to think about, a way of seeing the world as we enter Uh, 2020. Uh, And we're going to look at three things in this psalm, theology, doxology, and the mission of God. Uh, Theology is simply knowledge about who God is. Um, It's knowledge about his character, his attributes, his nature, uh, what kind of of a being he is. That's what theology is. Uh, Doxology, as I said, has to do with praise. It has to do with how we relate to God and how we praise him, how we glorify him. And then we're going to look at the mission of God. What is God doing in the world? And how do we, as his people, play a part? Um, so what we're going to do, we're just going to look at a couple of things from Psalm 96. I want to try to tie these together to hopefully give you a perspective, a way of view, viewing uh, the new year. Uh, but I hope that you didn't get too comfortable after you sat back down, because we're going to stand up again, and we're going to read this psalm together. We're going to go through this psalm together in a responsive reading. You'll notice up here on the screen in just a second, um, there's going to be some text up there, and a leader's portion and a congregation portion. And we're going to work our way all the way through this psalm. So if you'd please rise once again in the Lord's presence, and we will go through God's word. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Bless the earth and the majesty of our Lord. Strength and beauty are Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Say among the nations. The Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it, let the field exult and everything in it. may be seated. One of my responsibilities here at the church is to oversee and direct a lot of the discipleship ministry. So I got a lot of uh, discipleship stuff on my mind a lot, Um, and and I just want to bring to your attention, you know, when when Christ calls us to follow him, when Jesus calls us to to die to self to follow him, uh, discipleship engages the whole person. Um, Jesus calls us to follow him in every aspect of our life with everything that makes us up, with our minds, with our hearts, with our bodies, with our wills. Christian discipleship engages the entire person. 
um, the location of discipleship is not just in the mind. You know, Jesus does not just call us to think certain things and believe certain things. He doesn't call us to be disembodied thinkers, to be heads on a stick and just be existing in our ivory towers. Uh, nor does Jesus just call to follow him with our bodies, to where we just are seeking a spiritual experience. We're just seeking a, a bodily experience, an emotion, emotional experience. Uh, but when Jesus calls us to follow him, he calls us to follow him with every aspect of our being, our minds, our hearts, our wills, our bodies. Every aspect of who we are, we are called to follow Christ in that. And throughout the years, many Christian authors have you know, tried to help the church in thinking about discipleship, different types of models, how should we think about what discipleship is and what a, what a disciple is. Um, and there's one particular model um, that I think reflects the New Testament really well. Um, and the model is this, that we are called to follow Jesus, that discipleship is a, is a culmination of the head, the heart, and the hands. Uh, we're, we're called to believe certain things, we're called to experience certain things and love the Lord our God with our hearts. But we're also called to get to work. The hands are kind of a, 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 a symbol of work, of craftsmanship. Um, and that's what I'm trying to communicate today, uh, a vision for 2020, theology, doxology, and the mission of God. Theology is, is what we know about God. Doxology is how we praise God from the heart, and God's mission is how we get to work for him. And Psalm 96 really just brings all these three together, as I'm sure that you saw when we read that. Read that. Um, but what I want to do is just kind of break down each of these categories and just highlight some things for you in this passage. Um, this is probably going to be a reminder for some of you, but this might be some new information from this psalm. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at theology first. We're going to look at theology first and just ask the question, what does Psalm 96 teach us about theology? Um, in particular, what does Psalm 96 teach us about who God is? Who the, who, what is his character? What are his attributes? What's his nature? So that's what we're going to look at. And let's look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So the first thing we, one of the first things we see in this passage is that God is great. God is great, as verse 4 tells us. And because he is great, he is to be greatly praised. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Now when the Bible says that God is great, the Bible means that God is great in the highest, best, and purest sense of the word. God is great. He is the great God. That's who he is. The passage also says that he is to be feared. God is great, and he is to be feared. And when we think of the fear of the Lord, as the Bible frequently brings that phrase up, when we think about the fear of the Lord, what type of fear are we talking about? What type of fear are we talking about? Well, there's usually two types of fear that are associated when we think of the word fear. Uh, the first type is we fear something because of the harm that a particular thing could do to us. Uh, we are afraid of something because we might get hurt. That's why we fear something. I remember being a young boy. I remember this vividly. I remember being afraid of going to the doctor to get shots because I was afraid of what that was going to do to me. I was going to hurt, and I was afraid of the doctor. Um, but there's another sense of fear, what we're talking about, where uh, when we talk about fear, it's, it's awe, it's respect, it's reverence. And that's what the psalmist is trying to get at here, that we should fear the Lord because he is to be respected. He is to be revered because God is awesome. We, we serve an awesome God. Um, we could even say that he's an awful God. He's full of awe. So we should fear him. And this, this idea of fear should, it should really have us uh, think about the idea between a, rela a relationship between a king and his people. You see, whenever a king summons someone into his courts, that person should have a healthy amount of fear because the king is the most powerful person in the nation. You should have a healthy amount of fear whenever you go and visit the king. And even in our own day, regardless of what you think about our president, if our president were to summon you to the Oval Office tomorrow, you should probably have a healthy amount of fear, a healthy amount of respect and reverence for the office because he's the most powerful person in our country today. In the same way, we ought to fear the Lord. We ought to fear the Lord. He is great and he is to be feared. The text also says that he is to be feared above all the gods. And if you noticed in verse 4 there, uh, the word gods there, the G is not capitalized. Um, the author is trying to communicate the idea that these are the pagan deities. These are 
the Gentile objects of worship, the idols. Uh, he would later go on to say that they are worthless idols. You think of Zeus, Athena, uh, the Egyptian god Horus, the Canaanite god Baal. Uh, the gods of the people are worthless. And the reason the psalmist says that, he, 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 makes, he sets up this uh, relationship between the true God and the false gods. Um, it says here that the Lord made the heavens. The idols can't make anything. Uh, the, idol are lit- the idols are literally worthless things. They are non-existent things. But the Lord made the heavens. You see, that's the reason uh, why we should fear the Lord. That's the reason why God is great is because he is the creator. That's the psalmist's justification for saying that he's great and he should be feared because he made the heavens. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. God is the creator. And have you ever just stopped for a moment, whether you're out in nature or wherever you find yourself, have you ever just stopped and considered creation? Have you ever considered its power, its wisdom, its beauty, and its wonder. I mean, we sing that, that song, God of Wonders, because creation really is. It's, it's wonderful. Um, it's awesome. And Christian doctrine has always taught that the creation reflects the creator. Um, there are certain things that we find in creation, like order, like beauty, like wisdom, like power, that reflects its maker. Creation reflects the creator. And we see that that God is great because he is the creator. And I just want to give you an example of of the greatness of creation, the wisdom of creation. I want to just give you an example, just just one example out of the the many vast things that we could point to, just to to showcase God's wisdom. I want to talk about the human body, how really amazing the human body is. Just consider the, the fact that the human body is made up of 37 trillion cells. 37 trillion cells. Now, Sometimes we throw out these numbers like million and billion and trillion, and they're, they're so big, we don't even, we kind of just stop thinking about how big they actually are. Um, but just to give you an example of how big the number trillion actually is, um, one million seconds ago from this very second, one million seconds ago from this very second puts us at about 12 days ago. A billion seconds from this very second puts us at about 33 years ago. So a billion seconds from right now puts us about 1987. A trillion seconds ago, from this very moment, is 33,000 years ago. A trillion is a very, very big number. It's a huge number. And the human body is made up of 37 trillion cells. And as we just continue to get smaller and smaller, and each cell is made up of different components, the nucleus, uh, ribosomes, mitochondria, cytoplasm. And as we continue to get smaller, each one of those components is made up of, of an assembly of elements. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and even, we can go to even smaller things, subatomic particles, things like quarks and leptons and neutrinos. You didn't think you were going to get a science lesson today, did you? (laughs) But there are some things, some particles in the universe that are literally so small, they can pass through this piece of paper without touching another molecule, molecule, without touching an atom. That is amazing. That's just one body. There are 200 people in this room. There are 7 billion people on the the face of the earth. And the body is an amazing thing that God created. And he didn't just create our bodies. He created everything we see around us, things visible and invisible. God created it all. He fashioned it. He came up with the idea. He placed things where they need to be so things can function. There's power and wisdom and glory and wonder in creation. And it reflects God. God is great, and God is to be feared because he is the creator. The text also says in verse 6 that splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. This idea of splendor and majesty ought to call to mind the fact that God is the king. The psalm is a psalm about his kingship. God is the ruler over all things. He's the one on the throne. He is the king. He's majestic. He's royalty. He's also strong, as the passage says, and he's beautiful. So as we enter into 2020, as we launch out into this new year, remember that God is great. He is the creator. He is the king. He is strong. He is mighty. He is majestic. And he is beautiful. That's what this psalm teaches us about our God. 
And now we move into the second portion, doxology. Doxology. 2020 is a new year and a new decade, and we are called to sing a new song to the Lord. In verse 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. See, the text says that we are called to sing about his greatness. Uh, not whisper, not mumble, but to sing. There's something about singing that is beautiful. There's something about singing that is joyous. And there's something about singing that is public. And that's what we're called to do in 2020. We're called to sing about the greatness of the Lord. Not whisper, not be quiet about it, not mumble, but to sing. To sing in public, to sing joyfully, to sing beautifully to him. The text also calls us in verses 7 and 8 to ascribe. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. To, <coughs> to ascribe to the Lord is to acknowledge him. To acknowledge him as great. To acknowledge him as glorious. To give him the glory. To recognize him as being great. It says that we are called to, to give him the glory that he deserves. But what does that mean? It's kind of a Christian phrase that we say all the time, you know, glory to God. But what does it mean? What is what, what entails bringing glory to God that's kind of abstract? Well, the word glory, the word gl glory in the Hebrew language is, is kind of interesting. You might, you might be uh, interested to learn that the Hebrew word kavoth, where we get the word glory, is actually, it's a term for heaviness. It's a term for weightiness. It's a term for gravity. So when we say that God is glorious, we're saying that God is heavy. He's a heavy being. He's a weighty being. But still, what does that mean? God is spirit. We can't put him on the scale and weigh him. But God is weighty. Well, this idea also brings us back to, 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 to kings. You know, if we, were to, if we were to imagine ourselves to enter into a king's throne room, and we step into this throne room, and the walls are just full up to the brim, are full of gold. There's gold everywhere. There's valuables everywhere. There's treasures. There's so much stuff, so, much, so many spoils, so many valuable things that we would say that this king is weighed down in his treasures. He's heavy in his treasures. He's heavy with his glory. And that's where the idea of glory comes from, this idea of kings having valuables, that this king is weighed down in all his gold. He's a heavy king. That's what the glory of God is, God is talking about. He's heavy in majesty. He's heavy in valuables. The glory of God and the Bible also talks about the manifestation of his greatness, the, the display of God's greatness. That's his glory. Uh, when Moses, you, you recall in the book of Exodus, he asks if, the Lord, if he could see the Lord's glory. And the Lord is going to pass by and there's a bright light. That's, that's the glory of God. It's his greatness on display. But the text calls us to ascribe to him glory, to give him the glory. If we could picture ourselves, if, if we were to, to enter into God's throne room, to ascribe to him glory would, to, would be to give him everything we have, to give to him our treasures, to give to him our valuable things. And essentially, when the Bible calls us to give glory to God, he, the Bible is saying, give God your best. Give God your best. Give him the best thing you have, your time, your energy, your talents. Ascribe to him glory. Give him all your valuables. That's what the Bible is calling us to do. Uh, to give glory to God is to recognize him as being glorious, to tell others of his glory, and to live in light of who he is. It's to recognize who he is, it's to tell others about who he is, and it's to live in light of who he is. That's what it means to give glory to God, to recognize him, to tell others, and to live your life in light of who he is. And the glory of God is so central to the Bible. It's such a central doctrine that I would even argue that God's highest priority, God's highest priority on earth is the glorification of his name. God's highest priority is the exaltation and the glorification of his name. God's highest priority is not your comfort. His highest priority is not our self-interest. God's highest priority is not even America's flourishing God's highest priority is the glorification of his name. Now that almost sounds selfish. That almost sounds conceited. And it would be if it was any other person. If I stood up here and I announced to you that the goal of my life, 
my highest priority every single day is to glorify myself, that would just be annoying. That would be selfish. That would be conceited. And the reason is because I'm not worthy of all the glory. I'm not worthy of all the glory, but God is. See, God is the creator. God is the sustainer of all things. He's the one who's carrying out history right now. And he is worthy. He is a worthy being. Therefore, he deserves the glory. As the text says, the glory that is due his name. We owe him our glory. In verse 9, the passage also says, getting at this idea, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So in 2020, we, we go into this new year singing. We go into this new year singing of his greatness, of his glory, of his weightiness, of his majesty, and of his splendor. Don't whisper about the greatness of God. Sing it. Sing about the greatness of God. Third, we come to the mission of God. The mission of God. You'll notice in this psalm that the mission of God is universal. It's international and it's global. Several times the, 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 the psalmist talks about all the earth, the families of the peoples, all the nations. You see, the mission of God is tied to the rule of God. The mission of God is tied to the rule of God. God rules over all things. He's the king of the earth. He's the king of the world. Therefore, the mission is to go out into all the world. God is king of the nations. God's mission is for the nations and to the nations. And we even see in verses 11 and 12 that the created order is involved in God's mission. Verse 11, let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar. Let the field exult. Let the trees of the forest sing. You see, the psalmist is calling the created order to rejoice in the fact that God is working in the world. You see, God is not just saving us. He's not just saving human beings, but he's going to make all things new. Everything that's fallen in this world, God is going to make all things new. That's why he calls the created order to sing, to, to rejoice, to be happy, because everything is going to be redeemed. It's also interesting in this psalm that God is calling somebody to speak on his behalf. God's calling somebody to be his representative, to speak on his behalf. In verses 2 and 3 and in verse 10, he says, tell of his salvation. Somebody tell of his salvation. Somebody declare his glory among the nations. Somebody say among the nations, the Lord reigns. He's calling somebody to speak on his behalf. This was Israel. This was Israel's mission to, to showcase the greatness of God to the nations. And now it's, it's our mission as God's people, as the redeemed, to, to carry on this mission. We, we are the ones who are speaking to the world on God's behalf. But what exactly is God's mission? We've talked about its scope, the fact that it's universal. We talked about that, you know, someone needs to speak for him. We've talked about the, the creation is involved. But what is the mission? What's God doing? Well, I would argue that the mission of God is verse 3. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. That's the mission. To showcase and show forth the glory and grandeur of God. That's the mission of God, to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. That's our mission. As the church, that's our mission. And this is similar to what Jesus says in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. When he stands before his disciples, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Jesus' mission is an international, global mission. So that's our mission, church, to declare his glory in all things, to tell the world of his marvelous works. And that's got to be what we've, we're about week in and week out. Whether we're here, gathered on a Sunday morning, we have to lift up the glory of God and lift up his greatness. Whether you're gathering in your small group, remind each other of the goodness of God, of the, of the marvelous works that he's done. Tell the world of what he's doing, the fact that he created all things, he sustains all things that he sent his son into the world to accomplish and to secure salvation, how he died on the cross, rose again from the grave, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, making his enemies a footstool for his feet. Tell the world. Small groups, men's ministries, women's ministries, children's ministries, we must lift up this mission <clears throat> to declare his glory among the nations and tell everyone 
of his wonderful works. That's the mission he calls us to. So if the mission of God is the advancement of the knowledge of his glory and his kingdom, then you have the opportunity to contribute to that mission every day. It's not just pastors and preachers that carry on the mission of God. It's everybody. You have the opportunity, sitting in this church right now, to carry on the mission of God every single day. But we carry on the mission of God every single day in our everyday life, in the normal stuff of life, in the seemingly mundane things of life. That's how we carry on God's mission. We showcase the glory of God by doing not-so-glorious things. We showcase the greatness and the grandeur of God by not doing so great of things in our eyes. You see, but God calls us to carry on his mission in the everyday stuff of life. I mean, think about the, our Lord Jesus. The fact that for 30 years, he lived in obscurity as a carpenter. As a blue-collar man, getting his hands dirty, the Son of God worked in the everyday stuff, in the mundane, in the regular. That's the exact mission that God calls us to to bring the glory of who he is into those regular things, to bring his marvelous works, telling all of his marvelous works into those regular things. So what does the mission of God look like? It looks like, like I said, involving the whole person. It involves the whole person. It involves our mind, our hearts, our bodies, our wills. Everything of who we are is involved in the mission of God. And there's, because God is the creator of all things and because he's going to redeem all things, we don't have to prioritize seemingly spiritual things over physical things. You see, we can glorify God in everything we do. We can, glor- we can bring the mission of God in everything we do. We don't have to make this distinction to, to think that God gets more glory by, by reading my Bible and pray than he does me going to work. But no, we are called to sanctify all of life to him. Everything we do should be an offering to the Lord. As, as the Apostle Paul says, you're not working for men, work heartily for the Lord. Whether you eat or whether you drink, do it all for the glory of God. You see, we, we bring this mission of God into every aspect of our life, into birthday parties, into office meetings, into schoolwork. Whatever we find ourselves doing, that's where we bring God's mission. In 2020, friends, we don't have to become monks. We don't have to become super spiritual people and no one, not everyone has to become a preacher to carry on the mission of God, but the mission of God is carried on by the body of Christ, all of us doing our part, all of us working heartily for the Lord, moving in the same direction, declaring his glory, telling the world of, of his marvelous works. The kingdom of God is not on the backs of preachers. The kingdom of God is on all of our backs. We all take on the mantle to carry on God's mission. What does the mission of God look like? Well, everything you do in 2020, because everything in life is an offering to the Lord of worship, everything you do in 2020 should be done with excellence, to the best of your ability, with all your effort, bringing glory to him. Whatever you find yourself doing, whether you're starting a new business, whether you're going to school, whether you're putting in a nine to five, whatever you're doing, do it well. Do it with excellence. Why? Because God is pleased in those things. God is pleased when you give your effort for him. See, don't be like me. In college, I had, this, I had a bad worldview. I thought that God was getting more glory from me by neglecting my secular studies, but by studying the Bible more and studying spiritual things. See, God is not pleased with that. God is not pleased with neglecting these aspects of my life because I, I, I perceived that these things were more glorifying to him. But everything that we do, whether it's sac- secular, whether it's sacred, everything should be done to the glory of God. What does the mission of God look like? It looks like the parable of the talents. If you're familiar with Jesus' teachings, Jesus has this teaching in Matthew chapter 25 when he's, he's telling his disciples what the kingdom of God is like. What is it like to live within the kingdom of God? And he tells them this story of the talents. And a talent was a, a, a weight of uh, money. It was a type of money back in the day. And Jesus says that there's this master. He's, this master is about to go off on a long journey. And he, he calls these servants to himself. And he gives them talents. He, he apportions them talents. And to one he gives five talents. And to the next he gives two talents. And to the last he gives one talent. 
and the master goes on his way. And as the story goes, the, the man who received five talents, he invested his money. The things that were given to him, he invested it. He was productive. He got out there. He got to work, and he made a return for his money. He made five more talents. He was given five. He made five more talents. Same way for the second person. He was given two talents. He got out there. He invested. Um, he was industrious. He was productive, a little risky, but he got back two more talents. He made a return for his money. And the last person who was given one talent, he, he buried his money. He knows that investment can be a little risky, so he buried his money. It's not his. He buried it. Uh, the master comes back, and he comes to settle his accounts, and he, he comes to the man with five talents who made a return of five more. And he tells this servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in the little things, and I will set you over much. He comes to the second man. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in the little things. I will set you over much. And he comes to the last servant. And what does he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. He says, you wicked servant. You evil servant. You lazy, slothful servant. Which is kind of counterintuitive to us. It's not his money. He put it away. But according to the master, it was better for those people to get out, to invest their talents, to take risks and make a return for the money they've been given. And there's three words that can kind of sum up this, this uh, parable. Three words that I want to leave you with going into 2020. Faithfulness, responsibility, stewardship. Faithfulness, responsibility, and stewardship. That's what those first two men did. They were faithful with their money. They took it upon themselves as their own money, as their own responsibility to make something of it. And they were stewards. They were watching over it, trying to make a, a return for their master. So when we think about the mission of God, when we think about the parable of talents, friends, I want to encourage you, in 2020, don't bury your talents. Don't bury your talents. You see, each of us, God has given us so much. God has blessed us with so many things. We have houses, we have vehicles, we have jobs, we have spouses, we have children, we have family, we have friends, we have minds, we have bodies. Friends, those are blessings from the Lord. Those are things that have been given to you, just like the talent. And I'm calling you this day to, to be faithful with the things that God gives you. Be responsible with the things that God gives you. Be a good steward of the things that God gives you. For we will all stand before Jesus someday, believer and unbeliever alike. We will stand before his throne and we will give an account. He will ask us what we did with our time, what we did with the things he gave us, what he did with our children, what we did with our jobs. Invest. Be productive. Be like those first two good stewards that the master may say of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't bury your talents in 2020, friends. Through all your activities, whatever you find yourself doing, let your life declare the glory of God. Let your life be an offering for him. One of my favorite quotes is from a missionary. And he said, do great things for God. Expect great things from God. Do great things in 2020. Friends, we are sons and daughters of the king. Do great things on his behalf. So in 2020, we carry on the mission of God in our daily lives, declaring his glory and telling all of his marvelous works. I'm going to call uh, Peter Strutton back up to the stage, stage and we're going to close today by singing. But I want to show you the relationship between these three things, between theology, doxology, and God's mission. You see, it starts in the mind. The Apostle Paul says to be renewed, to be renewed in our minds. We need to know certain things about God, know certain things about who he is, how he's ordered the world, that we may then love him, you cannot love something you do not know. Theology, our minds, informs the heart that we may praise God and love God and be conformed to his image. And after that, we, we get out into the world and we work for him. We obey him in every day and every aspect of life. Theology informs our doxology. Our doxology motivates the mission that God has given us to declare his glory in all things and tell all of his marvelous works. We're going to sing All Glory Be to Christ this morning. And we sang this song last week uh, as we were anticipating 2020. But now that 2020 is here, we're going to sing All Glory Be to Christ. And may this song be our, be our song for the whole year. 
we would give all glory to him. Um, this song is, a, is, a, is a, to, a, to the tune of a popular New Year song, Auld Lang Syne. We've repurposed, we've repurposed the words um, to fit our needs. Um, so let's stand in the Lord's presence, and we will sing, All glory be to Christ. Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the fact that we can know you, the fact that we can praise you, the fact that we can work for you. So God, as we launch off into this new year, help us to be industrious, help us to be productive, help us to have great energy for you, to do great things for you. We thank you for this time as we got to remember the sacrifice of Jesus as we got to sing to you, for you are so worthy. 
We love you, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this teaching from Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that this teaching was an encouragement and a challenge to you in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Living Water is a Bible-based, gospel-centered church, and our mission is to lead people into a life-changing and ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're interested in more about us as a church, links and contact information are in the description box below. But be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell as well. Thanks again for watching.